Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. It's Joe Lum again with this week's album rankings. This week I'm going to be looking at a band from Boston called Extreme. And I'm going to rank all their six studio albums. I'm leaving out the EPs that they did in Japan and the two compilation albums they did. So here we go. Coming in at number six is 1995's Waiting for the Punchline. It's, a, it's Extreme's fourth studio album. Released on January 19th, 1995 at Criteria Studios in Miami, Florida and Sound Technique in their hometown of Boston, Massachusetts. It is known by fans as a distinctively raw sounding record with a significant influence from grunge, especially when compared to the big production of the two previous albums, Porno Graffiti and Three Sides of the Story. Due to its lyrics focus heavily on social matters, ranging from religion to fame, it is often cited as a concept album. It is also the only extreme record to feature drummer Mike Mangini, who replaced Paul Geary on drums, on three tracks by the way. After the album's tour, Extreme ex disbanded in 1996 when Nuno Betancourt, the guitarist, informed the band that he was leaving to pursue a solo career. After the split, Singer Gary Sharon joined Van Halen in that same year as their new lead singer, but left like three years later. I wasn't too I wasn't too keen on any of the songs on Waiting for the Punchline. There were some good songs on there like Hip Today, Cynical, Unconditionally. But other than that, the whole album sucked. Next. Coming in at number five is Saudade's D Rock, which roughly translates from Portuguese as Nostalgic Yearnings of Rock is Extreme's fifth studio album released on August 12, 2008 and it was produced by Nuno Betancourt. Wow. We don't know the studio where it came from or all that but it was recorded in between November of 2007 and April of 2008. On August 14, 2007 it was reported on Blabbermouth.net that Extreme we're writing a new song entitled Rock and Roll Man to perform at the Brad Delp, who was the late Boston singer, tribute concert, which was being held on August 19th in Boston, which is Extreme's hometown, naturally. In addition, singer Gary Sharon and guitarist Nuno Betancourt had begun written new material for Extreme's first post-reunion album. While it was reported that Extreme were re officially re reformed, the band would eventually begin work on their new album for the spring of 2008, which is, which is Sade's The Rock, those tragic yearnings of rock. <laughs> I didn't care too much for any of the songs, except for Star, which was their first single off the new record, Comfortably Dumb, and there was another song called Ghost on there. I don't know what the hell is that about, but other than that... The song is in the same category as Waiting for the Punchline, so... Next, coming in at number 4 is Extreme's self-titled debut album. Released in 1989, they were more of a glam metal band, but they're more into funk metal, F-U-N-K. Okay. It reached number 80 on the Billboard 200, produced a minor mainstream rock hit, Kid Ego. The single Play With Me is featured on the soundtrack to... Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and opening scene of Season 4 of Stranger Things, and the 2007 rhythm game Guitar Hero, Encore, Rock in the 80s. The album was primarily described as glam metal, but it also has been described as funk metal and hard rock. It was produced by Reinhold Mack, which is a German producer, which did work for bands like Electric Light Orchestra and Queen. I don't know where the studio came from, how long it took to re record it, so don't ask. I enjoyed the songs like Little Girls, Kid Ego, and Mother, I Don't Wanna Go to School Today, which was actually written by previous Extreme members before they hooked up the uh, classic lineup of Sharon, Betancourt, Pat Badger, and Paul Gary, the drummer. Not a bad album, to be honest with you. Next, coming in at number three is Extreme's latest effort, the sixth studio album entitled Six. Released on June 9th, 2023, 
on the label Air Music, once again produced by Nuno Betancourt. In the lead up to the album's release on March 1st, Extreme released the video called Rise as a first single and it crossed 1 million views in its first week, propelled by interest in Betancourt's guitar solo, which led to a number of analyst videos, analysis videos, including a reaction by Justin Hawkins from The Darkness and Breakdown by Rick Beato. Readers of Total Guitar Magazine voted the song solo as the third best of the 21st century in the 2023 poll. Rise was followed by a double A side single released on April 19th featuring the songs Hashtag Rebel and Banshee. Each song was accompanied by a music video. The fourth and final song prior to the album's launch was The Other Side of the Rainbow released on May 31st. Six was released on June 9th, 2023. And... I kind of liked the songs Rise, Hashtag Rebel, and The Other Side of the Rainbow. Haven't listened to any of the other songs yet, but uh, in my opinion, this was the best comeback album of Extreme's career. Finally, all the days of living past the success of More Than Words and Wholehearted from Porno Graffiti, it broke out of that mold. So, next, coming in at number two is Three Sides to Every Story. Three Sides to Every Story. It's the third studio album by Extreme, released on September 14th, 1992. It was the band's final album featuring the original lineup of Sharon, Betancourt, Badger, and Geary. They recorded it in early 1992 in the studios of New River Studios in Fort Lauderdale and Abbey Road Studios in London, along with the Symphony Orchestra. Produced by Nuno Betancourt and Bob St. John. The album is structured as a concept album in three sections labeled as sides, a play on the notion of different sides to a so story, and that of sides of an album in an LP or cassette media. The sides mentioned in the song Cupid's Dead as three sides to every story are named Yours, Mine, and The Truth, and each features a distinct musical style and lyrical imagery. Although it was their third record, bootleg recordings of Extreme's earlier days confirmed that at least two tracks for this album, Warheads and Our Father, existed and were performed in almost identical arrangements several years prior, dating back to the time of the self-titled record. Yours is made of hard rock songs, the guitar eccentric style, which the band had explored the most on their previous records. Their funk metal tendencies are present in tracks such as Cupid's Dead, which also features a rap section performed by guest John Prezio of the Juna, Jr. As a whole, this side details with political subjects, war as in warheads, peace as in rest in peace, government as in political calamity, racism and color me blind, media, Cupid's Dead. Summing up these matters, the side closes with Peacemaker Die, a tribute to Martin Luther King Jr., which featured a recording of his famous 1963 I Have a Dream speech. Mine, in total contrast, deals with introspective subjects in accordance to the band that parts its guitar and sound and experiments, guitar sounds and experiments with a different arrangement of the side, with Nuno Betancourt playing keyboards in addition to and in some of the tracks instead of the guitar. The side this opening song is Seven Sundays is a slow waltz with prominent keyboards and no guitars. Tragic Comic is also is mostly acoustic track telling a light hearted love story. Our father is sung from the perspective of a child of an absent father, although many interpret the song to be dealing with the God as the father. With Stop the World, the album starts to delve into more philosophical questions, expressing existing doubts, a theme that leads to religion with God is, is dead, written with the verb as an affirmation, but with a question mark. The chorus says, please tell me God isn't dead, I want to know, and don't leave me alone, a dramatic plea. The latter was not included in the CD version because of lack of space, whatever. Finally, the truth consists of three part opus entitled Everything Under the Sun, ending the three part album. 
this side nods is the progressive rock, not only to the format, but also in musical style, which changes in time's signature. And an intricate arrangement featuring a 70-piece orchestra. Lyrically, the spiritual theme set up in the end of mine is further developed in a Christian imagery present. The use of Roman numerals in the title is, this denotes three sides as the band's third album. Most of three sides was recording in New, St New River Studios in Fort Lauderdale, while the orchestra parts were recorded in Abbey Road Studios in London, home of the Beatles, by the way, <laughs> as they pay tribute to them. The album did well on the charts, making it up to number 10, and it went gold. I like the songs Our Father, Tragic Comic, Stop the World, and of course, Rest in Peace. Next. And we get to the number one record, Extreme 2 Porno Graffiti. Extreme's second album released on August 7th, 1990. Scream Studios in Studio City, California, and Cortland Recording in Hanson, Massachusetts. The album was produced by Nuno Betancourt and Michael Wagoner. It went double platinum thanks to the, the success of two hit singles, More Than Words and Wholehearted. It also featured two other tracks that were popular on MTV's Headbangers Ball around the fall of 1990, which was Decadence Dance and Get the Funk Out. Porno Graffiti is a concept album. It's a story about lost innocence and uneasiness. Through, though the album focuses on the same funk metal vibe as their, their self-titled debut, it became massively popular due to the acoustic song More Than Words. The album received largely positive reception. All music reviewer Steve Huey gave the album four stars and com commented that the band shows a strong desire to experiment and push the boundaries of pop metal format. I really enjoyed this album, to be honest, because of songs like Decadence Dance, Get the Funk Out, More Than Words, and Wholehearted. But that was just it. Those, those four songs really made that album to be... And it's probably the best album they ever did. The most successful one they ever did. Well, that concludes this week's album rankings. I'll be back next week with another one. Until then, this is JCP1977, a.k.a. Joe Lum, saying... Adios.